Welcome to Impact Wrestling, ladies and gentlemen. Now, there's something I need to address. Actually, several things. So, if I'll remember, I will put a timestamp so you can skip this mess if you don't like it. But I need to address a couple of things which happened in Impact. And I don't want to wait until the end of this review. Look, if you haven't heard what happened with... It's hard to believe that this happened with Tessa Blanchard. But several outlets have already talked about this. And if you haven't heard it already, Tessa Blanchard, before she got fired, you already know she refused to do any vignettes or anything to set up for some anniversary. You know this. Now, if you don't know, is that, and I don't believe Impact is lying about this. Because it makes no sense if they were. Tessa had the world title. She had it in Mexico. Since she did not want to do any more vignettes or do anything with Impact, they broke their contract with her. She's done. But instead of sending the title back, she wanted them to pay $150,000, if I'm correct. The price could be different, but $150,000 to get the title back. Now, if this was because she was owed money, that's one thing. No. Because eventually she did send it to them. And she didn't get paid. So that shows that she actually did this. And this doesn't fill me with a lot of comfort and confidence on my now 49th birthday. Yes. Yesterday was my 49th birthday. Now I've heard about these rumors and saw the evidence for the last couple of days easily. But I didn't want to report on it because it's just... I admit I have not been myself lately. A lot has happened in my life in the last six months next to this pandemic, which I don't really want to talk about. And I really haven't been myself. On and off, I've been off. And I have said this on camera. But hearing this, it just kind of goes with the title that I, I'm sure I'm going to put for this. I'm worried. And hearing this with Tessa Blanchard, and seeing this show, which I will start doing the review now, it doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence, ladies and gentlemen. You guys may be excited. I'm not, because of how this show was structured. Let's get into it. Trey versus Eddie. For the world, I want to make this clear I, more than once. World heavyweight title. Opening the show. Trey versus Eddie. For the world heavyweight title. Not the tag team titles. Not the TNA title. Not the X Division title. World duh title. Now, was it a good match? Yes, it was. I've never said Trey isn't a good performer or Eddie Edwards. They're both very good performers. And I didn't expect him on his first title defense after winning that title to job to Trey. So he wins. Very good. And I didn't expect that EY was not going to come out. Eric Young did come out like I expected. And he did the right thing. He said, and Eddie wants him. Eddie wants to rip his head off. But he said, on my time. You don't make the decisions. I make the decisions on my time. Good. I'm glad it happened. But it was in the opening of the show. For the, again, world heavyweight title. I'll see if I can remember if I don't get too pissed off about the show. Now, we had Raju. I, I, I don't understand what they're doing with Raju. You guys can tell me, please, what they're doing with Rahif Raju. He legitimately goes up to TJP and Falaba, and they're acting social distancing, fine, all right. You want to try and make a funny joke out of it and try to be honest about it, that's good. No problem. It can help people to deal with the social distancing thing, try to make it into a joke like most comedians would take a bad thing, turn it into a good thing, and I got no problem with it. But I don't understand what Raju is doing here. He tries to... Get these guys, well, mostly TJP, to consider going back into the X Division to have a title match with him. 
the, well, not him, but with Chris Bay. Try to get back in there so we can do something. Then he goes to tell Chris Bay this guy's after his title. Now, next week, we're going to have a tag team. Chris Bay and Raju versus Fallen Bond TJP. And here's the problem. If Fallen Bond and TJP weren't faces, this would make some sense. But they are. Then you got Raju, who is a heel. Now bothering another heel to get him to like him, but then is trying to set his ass up, so as far as I can see, to make him lose the title. Which, the way they booked, it, it doesn't make any sense. Now I'm sure you're going to say, oh yes it does. How? When you look at Raju, he's not doing anything. He's always the last string to be asked. So why would a last string guy ask the champion of the X Division to be in his corner when he just set him up on purpose for a tag match? It, it doesn't work. Particularly that Raju doesn't seem to be booked like a manipulative type of person. Remember, we're talking about Rohit Raju, a guy who acts brash, foolish, and loud, but not manipulative and not intelligent. So that makes no sense. If he was manipulative, if he was super intelligent and showed it, then it would be all right. But he's already jobbed a rhino. He already jobbed a heath. The heath, as I said. And now that moves me on to Moose. Moose had his interview with the most sexiest looking woman who's now in commentary. Well, not commentary, but the interview. I always tend to forget her name. I'm bad with names, to be honest. But he's pretty much saying he's going to give a person a shot next week. But then the Heath comes out. And the Heath is trying to screw with him to try and get an opportunity at the TNA title. And they're still doing the TNA committee thing. And pissing off Moose to get the title was a fine thing idea. And then when Scott DeMont comes out, DeMont, and he says, I see how you manipulated him into that match. And he says, clearly, if you win the match, you get a, you get a job. This, as I said before, is just like what they did in WWE back around, what, 2015, 2016? Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. It is something new in Impact. You don't normally do it, particularly with somebody like a Heath, normally, formerly known as Heath Slater. But, the question is going to be where they're going to go with it after that. Now, I'm hoping it will go well, but it's hard to say how far they're going to go with that Heath. You guys tell me below. And, we finally saw, and I know there was a couple of people in my comments on the last video that was talking about Kurt Hawkins, and what is his name? Um, Brian... Miles, I believe that's his name, last name Miles, was coming to Impact Wrestling. You had to look at Twitter. Well, I don't look at Twitter. It's not that I'm so dumb I can't function in Twitter. It's just that Twitter is very toxic and I tried to limit my exposure. Look, I got a Twitter account for my other channel and I don't use it. <laughs> I haven't loaded anything on it in two years almost. No, year and a half. I take that back. It's almost two years old and I haven't put anything on it since... Last year, around 2019. So I've had it for quite a while. So it has nothing on it. But seeing that he did get a nice vignette was cool. Hopefully there's more than one. I'm hoping there's two, maybe three vignettes to give us an idea of what um, Brian Miles is really going to do if his last name, is last name is Miles. But wondering how is he going to be different? He's still wearing the same type of clothes he did in WWE. You don't have to change it as long as you change your character or make your character more compelling than it was in WWE. If he's still the same old Kurt Hawkins, we got a problem. But that's just me. You guys tell me below. The North had a moment and you see Ethan Page unable to talk because he's so upset. And it's Josh Alexander who does it and he makes it very clear. We have been holding this place for a year. We've been holding it down. And all of a sudden you guys come in. And I'm not going for word for word. But this is what 
the emotion is. You took something from us. We're not right. We got our rematch clause. We're getting it back. And we're going to be what we've always been. The best. And still Ethan Page can't say a word. Now, you guys know how I feel. No matter how you feel about this. And I know you guys are happy. I've already said last week, this is a hard reset for Impact Wrestling. They decide to wipe the slate clean after Slammiversary and just start over. Now, in many cases, it will work well. But, sometimes you need to really book it right to make it feel right. And to be honest, seeing the Motor City Machine Guns having the title so soon is wrong. As good as it is that the North doesn't have the titles. And it should have been Falaba and TJP before the pandemic got bad. And they should have gotten those titles before that. And we could have had them holding it. We now have the Motor City Machine Guns. Which I don't agree with. I am completely against this. Not because I don't like them. I'm glad they're back. But it's too freaking soon for the Motor City Machine Guns to have the damn titles without a build up. Without really feeling who they are. They haven't been back for almost a decade. And there are many people. Yes, there's many fans who remember them. But you got to remember. We're on Access TV. And there's a lot of people that may be casual fans. That never heard of their asses. And it would have been better to last a couple of weeks. Before at least you drop the damn things to them. That's just me. You guys tell me below. And understand I'm not mad at the Motor City Machine Guns. I'm just mad that it got it so soon. EC3 had his vid pack. Now, I want to say this clearly. What I said before about EC3 when we were wondering if he was there and I heard more than a few people say he's going to be there two years or more. No. If you check with JDNYC as well as WrestleVote, they have already reported he only has a one-year contract. Just one. He's only staying for a year. And that's if something doesn't happen and he gets his ass removed or he makes a request to break his contract. It's one year. So when it comes down to it, this vid pack was very well done and he made it very clear. I'm here for one purpose. This is not because I didn't get a chance where I was. This is not because I was sitting and catering. He didn't say it, but that's where he was going with it. It doesn't make a difference what happened in WWE. This is what he said, generally, without mentioning their name. This is about me rewriting my life, history, making me better. I am destroying my past to make a new future. I am rewriting my past to make a new future. So, for me personally, it was a great segment, a great vid, vid pack, and it makes me feel like this is about him getting the TNA title because he was connected to it before he left. So my guess is that he will be fighting Moose for that title. And what's going to happen with Heath doesn't look good for him. And I'm being honest here. It's going to be mirroring exactly what happened with him. And I believe he was on SmackDown when this was going on around 2015 into 16. I could be wrong. It would have been Raw, but it could have been SmackDown. And it doesn't sound good for Heath because it sounds like he's about to get his ass whooped by Moose. Because I doubt he's getting that title. But this is the build for Heath similar to WWE. So he will get a contract. I just don't see him winning next week. Now, Kimberly versus Perazzo. Here's the thing that gets me with that match. I don't know why you must beat the champion to get an opportunity. Why couldn't she just beat a couple of people and get it? She has not won many matches. And having her go up against Perazzo makes no sense to actually win a chance to get the title match. It was dumb. And then worse, and I'm not against Kimberly. I actually like her. I do. But she got way too much defense in. This was way too competitive for the first match for Perazzo. The first match. You couldn't give her a squash match. Or at least a semi, semi complicated match. A little, a little hard for her. She had to struggle against Kimberly. And I don't think that was wise. She did beat her with an armbar. 
No problem. Tap their ass out. No problem. But then you have Jordan Grace comes out. Her arm is still messed up. But then she comes out, takes off the damn sling, and send whooping her ass. She's in my face whooping her ass. Now, that's not a bad thing. It's not. It makes sense. Because Perrazzo pissed off Jordan Grace so damn much. She didn't give a damn. She's willing to do whatever it takes to whoop her ass. But seeing Perrazzo have to struggle beforehand and then getting a butt whooped by Jordan Grace and then shoved out of the ring by Jordan Grace doesn't look good for Perrazzo. It doesn't. Now, does Perrazzo still have an opportunity? Yes, yeah, she does. She could still look and become a very good champion. But I just don't think that the build here is very good between Grace and Perrazzo. Particularly that Grace whooped her ass just after having a match which was heavily competitive, which it shouldn't have been. That's just me. You guys tell me below. We got two segments in one. One segment leading into another. The first segment was Shamrock and Sammy. And I see that Sammy's asking him, so what's the deal? What do you want to say to me? He says, you know, I can't think right now. I can't figure this out. I got to go away. And that, what is the deal? Is it finished with them finally? But then you see this gorgeous woman with abs of steel. Look, guys, you see Katie Forbes. She's in my face. If she's still with RVD, I really hope they stay together because I think they look like a nice couple. But that woman's got better abs than most men. That woman worked her ass off to have abs of steel. And then she interacts with a Sammy Callahan saying, please don't come near me. I don't deal with fans. And then after what happened with Shamrock, and that happened before, you got RVD bothering him saying, don't go near the merchandise. You may look, but don't touch. And I'm going, why? And then finally, and this was on the stream. This was talked about on the stream because I watched it and the stream was at 4K, at least over 4K. So the hard reset of Impact Wrestling and the good showing at Slammiversary has helped Twitch. The numbers have increased from 16 to 1,200 more than two months ago. No, less than a month and a half ago it was nearly 1,200 people watching to now 4,000 people plus watching Twitch, which is good. It shows there is now an interest and impact, even if it's slight. But let's be honest here. There was a question, if they're going to do like they did the last time and they got banned for a week, they were kind of worried. So when you see this situation, and then you see Katie Forbes being so excited about her website and willing to show what's on her website for $3.99, baby. You're going, okay, this ain't going to go like you think. And then... <laughs> Oh, there's a couple of shots. I'll be showing it and right here. But the one I like the most is in my face. I think I got like one or two shots. If I only got one shot, there it is. But this one, I know I got it. It's in my freaking face. That shit is funny. <laughs> Sammy's face. If I don't have it, I'm really mad at myself. Sammy's face on, on Katie's body, which has happened more than a few shots. But that one cakes a cake. Seeing that squat with those boobies and those abs, woo, that's a mess right there. And now Katie's angry. And then that begins to piss me off. It pisses me off. You know why? Why is Sammy messing with RVD and Katie Forbes? Why is RVD messing with, with Sammy Callahan? Why is Katie Forbes messing with Sammy Callahan? Why isn't Sammy Callahan? I want to make this clear. Sammy Callahan in the last two and a half years has been hotter than any wrestler on the independents, WWE or AEW because of what he did in Impact Wrestling. He made that feud between her and Tessa, the one I just spoke about earlier, who kept the title basically demanding over a hundred some thousand dollars to get it back when they didn't know her any money. Is relegated to this. It was funny, yes, to see Katie Forbes' picture with Sammy's face, but why the most hottest talent you have is relegated into a situation with two, re two I'm not saying they're irrelevant legends and Shamrock and RVD, 
But why isn't he in the main title scene? Why? Why? Tell me below what's wrong. What is wrong with this picture? You tell me below. Tell me what I'm wrong. Tell me why I'm wrong that Impact Wrestling, instead of using the best wrestler they have on the market, that they currently have under contract, in this position. Tell me why I'm right. Or tell me why I'm wrong. Finally. Oh wait. The Rich Swan question. You got. Look at this. I would rather see these two in a storyline together. Than them faking like they're not together and married. Please someone tell Impact Wrestling to just throw those two together for a little while. Let Madison Rain wrestle. Why don't you let. The Josh Matthews be her manager. Get a couple. Hell, get Stu Bennett from NWA to fill in for them for a while with the Pope D'Angelo De Niro. That would be a nice change up. Pay them temporarily while they're out of work. They're not working for NWA. I'm sure they're allowed to be able to do a little freelance. Let them. But let them do something. But before we do any more than that, you basically have Rich Swan talking to both of them and him saying he doesn't know what's going on. Well, he does know what's going on, but he doesn't know how to feel about it. He's not sure. There's so much stuff swelling in his head. And next week, he will address it at Impact Wrestling. He will come and tell them what's going on. So the question is going to be, is Rich Swan's contract expired? Or is he not resigning? Or are they going to put him into a better feud than what he has right now? Because he's in no feud. He's not really doing anything. He'll float like Sammy, and maybe he decided, even though his woman, which is Susie, who's in Wrestle House, which I'll get to in a moment, I know this is a long video, he may want to leave. Maybe he's going to go to AEW, or maybe they will give him something to do, because I don't think they're going to throw him into a feud with Eli, Eric Young, when he's supposed to be dealing with Eddie Edwards. So the question is going to be, what's going to happen? My guess is he's out again. Or he's done and he's going to go to AEW. Unless they're actually going to have some type of feud for him to do. Wrestle House. Again, we had... <laughs> this was the highlight of the show. It was funny. They said this was going to be one of the best things. And admittedly, it is good. It's way better than what you can get at WWE right now. And I know that certain episodes of WWE has been better than normal. But this was more fun. Seeing that they're in this house that is basically owned by Tommy, but he basically doesn't live there. And now either you got this if you win the contest, whatever it is, you get a million dollars. Or or this is about the three people in my face that I do believe have the shot. And this is about the Tessa, no, sorry, not Tessa. You see, I got Tessa on the brain. Taya. Rosemary and Johnny Bravo, where the only thing that matters to Rosemary is to win over Bravo from Taya Valkyrie. That's the reason why this was all set up. This is the reason why the Taya is here and she's trying to get rid of her. That's if it's going there, unless they're doing the million dollar thing. So everyone is there and it reaches a crazy pitch where everyone's trying to find a place to sleep. you got <laughs> AC Romero having to fight Crazy Steve for a ring in the backyard to sleep on because there's no room in there for more than 10 plus people. <laughs> it was stupid, but it was funny and I enjoyed it. Then you got the Deaners having an issue and why is, is Tommy sleeping in the same bed with Cousin Jake? <laughs> I believe I got that shot in my face. But it's a point that next day you got Cousin Jake versus Cousin Cody to a match because Jake snores, Cody doesn't, Jake gets woken up by his own snore and I know I've snored a couple of times in my life, more than a few, because of sinus congestion, allergies. And you got him blaming Cody and Cody's blaming Jake and then they have their match. And in the end, Jake wins, who wasn't surprised. It was different. Having the wrestlers all circling the ring was actually pretty good. Now, I wish they would do that in the impact zone. At impact. At least then, it would be better than what we've been having now. A empty arena. Very empty. 
very cold. And that's it. Now, finally, which really made me worry. The Good Brothers versus Reno Scum. Now, you already know what's going on with the Good Brothers dealing with Ace and Madman Fulton. The match itself, fine. The ending of the match, Good Brothers win. You got Ace coming out. Well, before that happened, Ace had already come out. He was watching. When the match was over, Ace comes to the ring. He messes with them. Then you got Madman Fulton coming in, wiping out, wiping out Carl Anderson, and then going after Luke. But they didn't really do much because they were basically dead, even going into the back. Now, here's the thing. I'm worried. Look, guys. I know a lot of you are so freaking happy that new people come in. You got Brian Miles. You got EC3. You got The Heath. I understand that. The Good Brothers there. I understand you guys. Who wouldn't be happy that's more people in Impact and maybe more coming on top of that. But this is where you get worry. You are opening the show with the world, and I repeat this again, World Heavyweight Championship. With Trey and Eddie. And you're letting the good brothers of Carl and Luke close the show. The good brothers. I say it again. The good brothers close the freaking show and less you're in another world. That makes no freaking sense. And I'm sure many people are going to say, well, hey, it is good. Look. If they do this once in a while, putting the world title in the opening of the show, there's nothing wrong with that, and I would agree with you. But that's if there was something closing the show that was heavily relevant. We're talking about the Good Brothers, dealing with an ace and madman Fulton. I say it again. Good Brothers facing ace and madman Fulton, proxy renal scum. No, it's wrong. You could have done something special with the Motor City Machine Guns. You could have done something special with Chris Bay. Why couldn't he have a title defense on the show? Huh? Why couldn't you have Moose close the show with the TNA title? Why couldn't you make the most important people on the damn show the most important thing? Now, I'm not happy that the Motor City Machine Guns are the champs right now, but at least it would make more sense to have the tag champs close the show, have those guys be in the middle of the show, and then at the hour mark, they could have already had that match, and then you could have had Carl and Luke come out and say something to Motor City Machine Guns, setting up something. And I'm not even saying that's good, but it would make better sense. We are talking about making it clear. The new people taking precedence over the old people. This is exactly how Impact Wrestling always functioned for years. They bury the old people and they do nothing with the new ones. Look at what's going on with the Rascals. They're not doing anything different. Hell, they had suicide on their show. I'm worried. I could be wrong. And... I'm making it clear. This is getting long, but I'm, I gotta say this. I could be wrong about this. And I have no problem being wrong about something like this. But I don't see this being good. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me what I need to be seen to understand that all this is gonna be great. Or you have the same concerns as me that Impact Wrestling and the writing team are gonna screw this up so badly that a lot of people are in denial and they don't wanna see it. But this is just me. Have a good day. Have a good night. Peace.